Assalamu alaikum, this is Dr. Mona al author of The Muslim Narcissist. In today's podcast, I'll be speaking about the narcissist relationship with his or her qareen, and I want to explain how the qareen forms the narcissistic character of that person. Now, if you don't know already, and I say this in every podcast, please refer to my previous podcasts about the qareen and the nafs and the human body and the human creation so that you can understand my, my podcasts in the future. Um, and you will understand when I say qareen, you will automatically know what it is I'm referring to. So just a quick summary, the qareen is the evil jinn devil that accompanies every one of us. And the evil qareen is the one who whispers the you know negative satanic thoughts into our minds and they mess with our mental health. Um, they mess with our psychology, they mess with our mindset, they mess with our perception of the world and other people and ourselves. So it's very important to really fully understand the qareen. Uh, in this podcast, I want to speak about the narcissist relationship with the qareen and how the qareen will influence all their narcissistic behavior on themselves and on other people. So there are lots of misconceptions in psychology about where narcissism is rooted so in psychology, you will find that many people actually brand narcissistic people as being evil, when actually the evil person is not the human being, but the qareen that has overpowered this human being. So it's not the actual human being that hates their victim, it's the qareen that hates their victim. So I'm going to explain this um, in further detail in just a moment, but I just wanted to make it clear that there, you know, this relationship does exist. It's a very to- highly toxic relationship, highly problematic and highly dangerous um, relationship. And I will explain how um, some people have more toxic relationships with their qareens than others and, you know, why that happens. So in order to make sense of this podcast for you, I need to separate the human being from the qareen for you to understand how a narcissistic person you know develops their character so the narcissist so the narcissist is essentially somebody who is working with their qareen okay so you have the human being like an empathic human being what makes them narcissistic is their alliance with their qareen with their evil qareen so it creates the narcissistic you know personality now, if you take out the Khareen from the equation, the human being that's left is a victim of his or her own childhood. So, you know, narcissistic people, they tend to have very problematic childhoods. They had an unfair upbringing, maybe an abusive upbringing. They were neglected, abandoned. I mean, some of them were overly spoiled. We'll come on to that in a moment. But when we talk about the covert narcissist, you'll often find that they did not get the love that they received. So as children, they were victims, okay? They were victims of their own uh, environment and their own unfortunate upbringing. Maybe they didn't have Islam in their upbringing. Maybe they were, you know, raised by alcoholics or raised by fathers who repeatedly, you know, beat their wives and the children had to witness that. You know, some women have been raised by very abusive, physically abusive fathers, um, you know, raised by older brothers who had sexually, you know, harassed and manipulated them when they were younger. So essentially, if you look, if you really look into the childhoods of many narcissistic people who have MPD, narcissistic personality disorder, you will find that they were often suffering a lot in their childhood. Now, <clears throat> the suffering that they had been through wasn't addressed at the time. And this is often the case when a child is one of many or when the the mother of a, a narcissistic child is a codependent who is abused, she will not have the energy or time or you know the capacity in her heart to actually give love, give love to her children because she's so busy being occupied by the abuse that her husband or her partner is being, you know, is inflicting on her. So a lot of codependent mothers who go through a lot of abuse do not have the time and the energy and the care and the love to put into their own children because they themselves are so depressed and they themselves are suffering from their own mental health problems so they cannot give what they don't have inside. So a lot of children um, translate that and interpret that as, you know, mum doesn't love me. 
um, mum hates me, mum, you know, can't cuddle me, mum can't talk to me, mum doesn't care about me, mum doesn't care about, you know, the friends that I hang out with outside the house, she doesn't care where I am, she doesn't realise if I'm in the house or not in the house. So narcissistic children will grow up with those feelings and resentments towards their mothers in particular because they always felt neglected. And it's because they've taken it so personally, they've grown up with a grudge. And during that time in their lives, no one was there to actually address this for them. So no one was there to separate their, them, you know, these children from what's going on around them. So children, you know, they grow up um, believing that their parents never loved them, believe that everything that happened, all the abuse that they went through, everything that they saw, you know, happening in the house, all the fights between their parents, all of that was taken on by the child as a personal attack against him or herself because they don't feel worthy of being loved and they don't feel worthy of being, you know, cared for and loved. So, you know, when when they feel like that, coupled with everything that they're seeing going on around them, they're going to take it personally. A lot of children, because they still can't process their emotions, especially children, but, you know, between the ages of, you know, three and four, up until the age of 10, um, no one's there. If there's no one there to teach children how to process their emotions, children will, e will either bottle it up inside and interpret it in their own way, which is dangerous because that's what happens with narcissistic people. They bottle up their emotions, translate it in the way that they want to see it, and then carry that with them for the rest of their lives. Carry that grudge and that hate towards their parents for the abuse that they were put through and everything that they were made to see and for feeling so unloved and, you know, and not worthy of love. So all of that is taken with them into adulthood and it manifests into abuse, the abuse of others. Um, and more importantly, it manifests in the abuse against themselves. Um, I'll explain that and I'll explain that shortly. So what I want to highlight here is that because when when children don't have someone to, to address their emotions when they're young, it is very easy for children to blame themselves for everything. I mean, I've, I've counselled so many children who blame themselves for their parents' divorce. It had nothing to do with them. But because they consistently saw their parents fighting, so for example, if one day the child didn't do his homework or he didn't go to bed on time, and the parents would fight over that, saying, I told you to put him to bed. I told you to help him with his homework. He's got bad grades now because you didn't help him with his homework and all that. And the child hears this and now he's thinking, my parents are fighting because of me. I'm a terrible child. I'm a terrible person. Um, I'm not worthy of being loved because my parents are always fighting over me. And then when those parents eventually divorce or split up, the child carries that resentment towards himself or herself because they believe that they are the cause of that divorce. Now, all the while, the child never expresses these feelings. The child never actually talks about these feelings to anybody because they feel ashamed. This is where the sense of shame starts in the narcissistic person. So that sense of shame of, you know, um, I'm such an awful kid that... You know, I caused my parents divorced. I always caused my, you know, parents to fight and argue. They immediately from that age they develop a sense of, um, a sense of shame, and they decide from then on, because I'm not a good kid. I'm not a good person. I'm not deserving of being loved. This is just one example of many, but it's just this is a common thing. It's a common um. It's something common that I've heard with various children, girls and boys, that I have uh, coached. So narcissists grow up with this deep feeling of shame, a deep feeling of resentment, bitterness, anger. They feel a lot of anger towards their parents because all they wanted was stability. All they wanted was love and care and affection, especially if they saw other kids who have affectionate and loving, empathic parents. Now, when, you know, when you go to school and you see your parents at the school gates and, you know, your parents are very rough with you, but you see your friends and their parents are very different. They're very loving. They're very kind. Again, the bitterness here, it, it fuels. It gets it gets fueled. Um, 
you know, other examples would be, you know, how compassionate maybe other parents are when children don't get good grades. But when they go home with bad grades, the father might beat him or her. When I, you know, when I, when I talk about people, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to men and women here. <clears throat> so they might get shouted at by the father, beaten, slapped, ridiculed, verbally abused, you know, for coming back with bad grades. And then he'll compare that to other people's parents who are more compassionate. They say, it's okay, no worries. I know you did your best. I know you've tried hard. Next time, inshallah, you'll do better. You know, th- 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 again, you know, when, when narcissistic children grow up seeing the difference, it fuels more hatred, way more hatred, way more bitterness, way more resentment towards their own parents. And they carry that. They carry that with them because the comparison consistently confirms to them in their minds that I'm not worthy of being loved and my parents are horrible people. Like, I wish I had different parents. I hate my mom and I hate my dad. And they grow up with that. Now, if someone has been raised in a a practicing household, he or she will know that they cannot express that hate to their parents in public, right? So they will pretend to love their parents for the sake of keeping up appearances. But deep down, there's a resentment. And that's why until now, you find people in their 30s, 40s and 50s, they will do good things for their parents because it's maybe a religious requirement or a social requirement or a family requirement that, you know, that they have that respect and um, honour towards their parents. But deep down, they hate their parents. Deep down, they've got that resentment where they're just putting on a show, they're putting on an act because they're in their 30s, 40s and 50s and they still resent their parents for what happened as children. They still resent their parents for not being the parents they needed them to be when they were children. This is the foundation and the core of narcissistic personality disorder. So essentially, these people are victims because no one was there to help them process their emotions as children. If someone was there as an adult um, to explain to the child that this has nothing to do with you, you know, you know, parents fight all the time and, you know, you're not to blame for this. And that your parents love you and, and this and that and this and that then children won't attach themselves to that trauma. That's why you call it childhood trauma. Because the child creates a trauma in their mind based on what they perceive the situation to be, rather than what the reality of the situation actually is. Um, This is different, of course, for children who are physically abused. Um, Physically abused, sexually abused, verbally abused. You know, when it's direct towards the child, then that becomes a reality, you know, a trauma of reality. But when the child is um, an indirect target of their parents fighting and divorce and the mother's toxic reactions to, you know, the abuse of her husband on her. So she might lash out. She might scream, you know, excessively. She might be highly irritable, angry all the time, depressed all the time. When the child translates that as an attack, a personal attack against him or herself, then it creates a childhood trauma that's not based on reality. So I found from counselling children that they actually understand direct abuse more than the indirect abuse. The indirect abuse is more damaging. It's far more damaging to the child than the direct abuse because... When a child has an abusive father who is abusive to him or abusive to her, then they will know that, you know, the problem is directly between them and the parent. But when it's indirect and they have to assume all sorts of things and they never talk about it, they bottle it up, um, that's when it becomes more dangerous because now they're starting to, you know, create their own reality in their head. And it's a fantasy world. It's a fantasy world of everything that's going on. And a lot of children have very dark thoughts. And when I say dark thoughts, it can be murderous sometimes. Like some some children actually have the fantasy of killing their own parents. And they're under the age of 10. Um, so a few years back, I did uh, a few courses on analysing children's drawings and paintings. 
because these um, really come in handy in counselling. And until now, sometimes I ask parents for, you know, drawings that their children have um, have created, not when they're asked to draw something specific, but when they freelance. So when you when you give them some, you know, pens and colouring pencils and, and, and pa- sheets of paper and just ask them to draw whatever, whatever is in their mind, you will actually know the psyche of the child. OK, you will know what's going on in their mind. And I did an exercise with children and some of them came back really nice because, you know, you can tell that they, they come from an empathic home by the, you know, the drawings that they have, um, you know, they've created. And then you've got some who came from toxic homes and the, and the drawings were really creepy. The drawings were very dark. You know, they had demons in them and, and you know, just beasts and daggers and, you know, lots of, lots of dark colouring as opposed to other kids who used colours. So... A lot of children, you know, people underestimate what children go through under the age of 10. Um, a lot of children, they like their, the hate for their parents runs so deep that they actually want to kill them. I've spoken to children who say, I wish my dad was dead. I wish I had a gun. You know, like I spoke to one little boy once and um, I said to him, what would you like for Eid? We were talking about Eid and trying to get him to enjoy Eid. And he said, I want a gun. And I said, why would you want a gun? I said, you mean a toy gun? He's like, no, a real gun. He was about seven years old. And I said, what do you want to do with that gun? He said, I want to kill my dad. So what I'm trying to highlight here is that if these dark thoughts are going through the minds of a seven-year-old, then can you imagine the dark thoughts that go through the mind of a 30-year-old, a 40-year-old? And, you know, as you know, MPD gets worse with age. So if a child doesn't find an empathic adult at that time to work through their problems with, this child will grow up um, with these thoughts towards their parents and towards anyone else who they feel has wronged them. And it just they just keep feeding those thoughts. You know, they're fed and they're fed and they're fed. Because what's going to happen is that if this happens when the child is seven, More experiences are going to happen. More negative experiences will happen with the parents when they're 10, 11, 12, 18, 21, and they will accumulate. Now, these things start to accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. So, for example, I've got a client, uh, he's 19, and he's always had issues with his dad. And now he's he's been recently kicked out of the house because he was caught smoking weed. So... Instead of the father trying to get him help, you know, trying to get him support, um, he, you know, the father was just so disappointed in him, so angry, he kicked him out of the house and he didn't care where he went. He's like, you know, take your stuff. I don't care where you go. I don't want to see you in the house. So can you see how the problems will accumulate? The hate will accumulate because the the child or, you know, the growing adult is not finding the love and support and advice and compassion from the parent, still until now. Until now, they still feel unworthy. They still feel uncared for. They still feel like, I'm worth nothing. I'm not worth anything. And your worth is always taken from your primary caretakers. So they, they would more often than not be your parents. If you weren't raised by parents, you were raised by grandparents, it would come from them uh, and so on. So How you feel about yourself, your sense of worth and your self-value always comes from your parents when you're growing up. So if you reach the age of 21 and you have parents who you feel do not care about you or they're abusive or they're very difficult, then you will, your mind will be programmed to believe that you're not worthy. You're not worthy of anything. And there's always that sense of shame that you have no self-worth, you've got no self-value, it's, it's, it's that deep feeling of shame that a narcissist has growing up, that, you know, I've got, no one loves me for anything, um, so this is usually the covert narcissist, the covert narcissist is the one who just feels entitled to everything, the one who struggles to get the approval of, you know, his parents or her parents, You've got the golden child narcissist. The golden child narcissist often has an overinflated ego by the by the parents. So 
um, they tend to be the mummy's boy or the daddy's girl. They tend to grow up differently. They don't have hatred or resentment towards their parents as such, but they um, have unrealistic expectations from the world and other people because of the pedestal that they have constantly been put on. So the covert narcissists are usually those who deeply resent their parents. Now, when it's men, it's usually towards the mother. They have deep resentment and hatred towards the mother. And the girls have a deep resentment and hatred towards their fathers. Now, when they are golden children, there's no, the hate's not there, but their expectations of other people are very high. So they expect to be treated like God's gift to the planet. You know, they want to be put on a pedestal all the time. They want to be praised and hailed and everything the way that they always were growing up. But the covert narcissist is more, is looking for validation. You know, they're looking for validation. They're looking for a sense of worth. And that is why you will find that the covert narcissist is often a man child. And the covert narcissist female is the woman child. So they, in adulthood, they tend to look for parents rather than partners. And that's why a lot of people feel like they they end up becoming the parent in their their marriage to that part, to that narcissist. Because the narcissistic man, covert man, is always looking for a replacement of his mother, the mother he never had, to compensate for his loss of childhood. So you will always find that if you are married to a covert narcissist, He's a man-child, he's a Peter Pan, got Peter Pan syndrome, never wants to grow up. He is still stuck at the time of his trauma. So if his trauma started from the age of seven, his mindset in his personal life and his family life will be of that of a seven-year-old. And the same goes for, for a woman. And that is why a lot of people find in, the, in long-term relationships that they're dealing with a man-child. They're dealing with someone who just wants a parent because when it comes to marital responsibilities, they don't know how to take care of them. They don't know how to be a real man, a proper alpha responsible man. They don't know how to be family men. They only know the fun side of things. They know how to be great fun dads and, you know, they enjoy activities and traveling and everything. But ask them to man up and actually take responsibility and be mature and solve problems efficiently, and solve the family issues, and, oh, they can't. Here, they want mum. And a lot of women find that they slip into being that parent, you know, that person's um, that person's mother. And the same for men. You will find that you will end up dealing with your wife as a teenager. You will end up being her dad, because she's got deep daddy issues that weren't resolved from her childhood. She will always feel like, men don't love me. Because my father never loved me. You know, why should you love me? Prove your love to me. So a man is constantly bending over backwards to prove his love to this woman because she's got a huge void in, in who she is because she was never properly loved by her father. So no matter what you do, it's never good enough because it's not you she wants it from, but you're the best she can get. You're the closest person she can get to her father a loving father, but you could bring her the moon and the sun, it's never going to be enough because she actually wants it from her dad. And she may never get it from her dad. She may know that she will never get it from her father. Her father may have passed away. He may be in jail. He may be God knows where. So she will already know that she is asking for very unrealistic things from you knowing that she'll never get never get them from her father but because of that childhood trauma she's unable to work past that she is unable to rationalize that in her mind that I need to put that to bed now and actually just focus on this great man who's doing everything he can to compensate me for whatever it is I'm missing in my life narcissists can't think like that And that is why a lot of men suffer in their marriages because, you know, to any rational person, to any logical, empathic person, you would know that everything that you do for that person is to be appreciated. It's like great. You know, anyone would love that. That's in your rational mind. But 
the narcissist is not a rational person. You cannot um, expect the narcissist to think the way that you do. The narcissists, narcissists are not intelligent. They're not emotionally intelligent people. They don't have that emotional intelligence when it comes to, you know, understanding how to deal with other people and, and what to set and how to separate childhood traumas from the good that they have already in their lives. That's why they self sabotage everything. They self sabotage everything because they have no emotional intelligence. You are constantly frustrated at having to deal with someone who has the mind of a child and you you have the mind of a 30 or 40 year old adult so these relationships don't work because communication is impossible it's it's actually impossible to communicate with them so let's rewind a little bit and go back to um children who take these traumas with them into adulthood now you'll find that a lot of these a lot of these um children they enter the teenage phase of their life and they go straight into smoking, straight into weed, straight into pornography, um, horror movies, you know, drinking. It's, it's often the children from dysfunctional backgrounds that jump straight into, you know, finding solace in addictions. And this is where the addictions start, yeah, um, okay. people. It's via vile music. So heavy rock, rap with filthy lyrics. Um, music that talks about, you know, zinner, encourages zinner, encourages crime, encourages problematic behaviour, promiscuity, immorality, misogynistic views of women, objectification of women, sexualization of women, all of that you know, it, it really draws the gin into people. They, bec- you know, they, they now become a part of your environment and they will either take over your psyche or they will possess you. So you'll often find a lot of teenagers listening to this vile music when they're young and then they tend to like the same music when they're older. Like you still see people in their 30s and 40s and they listen to vile music. And that's why you know, for the most part, music is haram in Islam. It is forbidden because of how vile it, of how vile so much of it is. I mean, so much of it is satanic and demonic as well. If you look at the video clips of a lot of um, music out there, it's it's really satanic, really, really satanic. So there's no, it's no surprise that problematic music or immoral music can bring in the gin devils to you the same way horror movies can so again I was you know I mentioned it in my previous podcast watching horror movies especially horror movies about the gin and ghosts and zombies and and all those things you know it's their environment you are now in their environment and they're it's entertainment for them too so when you're constantly watching things like this that are vile filthy problematic disturbing horrific immoral when you're watching this all the time or regularly you've opened a portal for them to come into you to come into your life and and be a part of who you are as a person because you resonate with them now you have the same likes as them they gravitate towards the filth and the vile and and all that kind of stuff they you know you've got common ground you meet them on their level on their same vibration so of course they're going to come into your world It's a no-brainer. These are the kind of human beings they want to be around. So be careful with the music you listen to. Be careful with the music your teenagers listen to. Because it usually starts from there. It usually starts with them listening religiously to problematic music. And they will often get a lot of... um, Why? It's, It's haram because they get encouraged. People get encouraged to do what's being sung about in the songs. Now, I don't believe that all music is haram. I think some music is really beautiful and therapeutic to listen to. Um, but I am definitely with, you know, the the scholarly opinion that all music that has, you know, satanic energy in it and immorality is completely forbidden by Islam. Completely, 100%. And even, like, there are romantic... 
um, there are there is romantic music that you can listen to, but if you listen to it, what I want you to do, the next time you listen to a playlist in the car, listen to the um, romantic songs, especially the ones of today, like the modern ones, and you will notice that they're all narcissistic. It's like the love bombing phase, um, toxic relationships, you know, it's either the codependent singing or the narcissist singing. Um, so make a note of it the next time you listen to music, you will find that it's the narcissist or the codependent. The weak codependent who can't live without the narcissist and the narcissist who's discarded or love bombing their victim, right? So, um, yeah, there's, subhanAllah, like, we have many reasons and evidences as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden so many things that are not good for us. And it's only with knowledge do we know and experience that, you know, can we connect knowledge and experience together to actually find the reasons why, um, you know, listening to music, especially when you're on your own. Don't listen to VAR music when you're on your own. You'll attract them to you. Don't go to nightclubs. Don't go to places where... You know, vile music is being played and moral music is being played. I mean, the other day I was driving and I had my window down because it was so hot outside. And there was um a car that pulled up next to me, next to the traffic light. And they had their window down too. And they were playing rap music and the lyrics were so obscene. I had to put my, I had to put my window up because it was so disgusting. I did not want to hear it. I put my window up. Because it was so bad. And they were completely desensitised to it. Like there was no shame whatsoever that they were listening to this music. There's no sense of shame. Because the jinn, the qareen, is now taken over. And when the qareen and the jinn have taken over you, you will feel no sense of shame. You will normalise major sins. Anyone who normalises major sins or you know, problematic behaviour like this, where there's no shame that they're listening to such obscene music in public, where other people can hear it, know that these people have been taken over by their qaneen and their ashiq jinn or any other jinns. I promise you. Because the eradication of shame and humility and feeling humble and feeling shy, having that hayat, that modesty, if that's been taken away from you, you best believe that your qareen rules over you. You have no power over your qareen. You are the slave to your qareen. A narcissist is a slave to his qareen or her qareen. So I just wanted to make that point. Okay. So when someone gets used to dealing with their emotional problems um, by, as, you know, by means of distraction. So for example, if you get high on weed... It's a distraction from your problems. You don't actually have to address all the problems that you're facing at home. You don't have to, you know, face the shame. You don't have to face the reality of the situation. Um, you don't have to face the feeling that you have of being so unworthy and so unloved. So a lot of a lot of adolescents they they go around looking for distractions, and a lot of them will find it in these things. Okay, and that's why a lot of young boys in particular and young girls too, from the age of 12, 13, they jump straight into boyfriends. I'm talking about people who have been raised as Muslims. They will jump straight into having boyfriends and relationships after relationships after relationships in school because they get some sort of love from those relationships. They get a sense of, you know, feeling worthy. And this is where the narcissism starts because... What you're looking for isn't healthy. You're, 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 you're jumping into relationships from a very young age, um, not with the good intention. You're looking for something to make you feel worthy. So when you jump into a relationship with, let's just say you're 13 years old or 14 years old, and you jump into a relationship with a girl and she's making you feel really special, now it's not about the girl. You don't actually care about the girl. You care about how she makes you feel. And that becomes an addiction. Okay? That now becomes an that feeling becomes an addiction for a teenager who is now developing narcissistic personality disorder. 
And that child, sorry, that teenager will want more of it, want more and more and more and more of it. So they just jump from, they get used to the habit of just having girlfriend after girlfriend after girlfriend. And then this escalates, this escalates to sexual relationships and it escalates to the experimentation of maybe other types of sexual relationships. Like they might experiment with homosexuality. You find a lot of teenage boys and teenage girls, 18, 19, oh, they're already experimenting with um, with gay sex and all that kind of stuff. So this is one type of um, teenager who just finds their solace and finds their value and, and worth and they get that dopamine hit from feeling special. You know, someone someone out there loves them and they feel special and it distracts them from all the problems that they're having at home. It distracts them from the hate that they have for their mums, from the hate that they have for their dads. So now they've programmed themselves to seek approval, validation and a sense of worth this way, by jumping from girl to girl or boy to boy. Now, another type could be <clears throat> alcohol. So maybe if you get to the point of intoxication, you know, you get you become drunk. A teenager might really like the feeling of that because it's a distraction. When you're in a state of being drunk, you can't think. When you're in a state of being high, you can't think. When you're watching pornography all the time and you're excessively masturbating as a, as a teenager, it's a distraction. It's a pleasure that you are distracting yourself, using to distract yourself from you know, the, um, the difficulties of daily life. So you've got different things, you know, I'm talking about the unhealthy habits and behaviours that some teenagers will pick up. And it's these teenagers who pick up the unhealthy habits who become narcissistic. Now, when does the Qareen see an opportunity to take advantage of this? It's in teenage phase. So the Qareen, usually it's the Ashaq, it's the Ashaq Jinn and the Qareen who both target the teenagers. So again, please refer to my previous podcast about the Ashaq Jinn. Um, they will enter the lives of teenagers during this phase. So as I explained before, when a human being is in this state of being depressed, angry, jealous, envious, bitter, they're full of hatred, their vibrational level of energy matches that of the evil jinn. And that is why the evil jinn will come to you and are drawn to you at your lowest moments. And that is why people's iman is always hit in their lowest moments. That's when you get all those doubts, self-doubts, doubts in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you're at your lowest. You know, where is Allah? Why does Allah not help me? Why this and why has this happened to me? You know, when you're at your lowest, the evil Qareen will target you then. Your Ashaq Jinn will target you then. Now, if you have both, if a narcissist has both, or he becomes a very dangerous narcissist growing up because he's got two working on him now, not just his Qareen, he got the Ashaq Jinn as well. The Jinn that has been sent to corrupt him. So the Ashiq Jinn in narcissists, in narcissistic teenagers, um, usually fuel sexual pro- promiscuity. So you will find that they enter sexual relationships from a very early age and it's excessive. Okay, that's the Ashiq Jinn who enters the life of a teenager with that purpose to just get this person involved in zina from a young age and repeatedly. Like this is his best way of dealing with his problems. And like I said, this is, again, I'm referring to my previous podcast, it is at this time, usually teenage phase, when people who have MPD develop feelings for the same sex as well. So this is ten- this tends to be fueled by misogyny as well. So if a man really hates his mother, really, really hates his mother... Um, he would tend to have, you know, his mindset has now been programmed by the Qareen to, you know, enjoy the company of, of men more. 
And this is why a lot of covert narcissists are closet gays. A lot of them are closeted homosexuals because they would experiment during their teenage years um, and homosexuality. They'll dabble around or experiment a bit or they'll develop feelings for other young men or if they're women, they'll develop feelings for other women. But because of the shame and because of the Muslim upbringing and because of society, they keep it closeted. They keep it closeted. But they grow up, you know, um, being closet gays because their qareen is really working on them and their ashiq jinn is working on them. So if you think of the ashiq jinn, the ashiq jinn is, like I said, it fuels sexual promiscuity. So sexual promiscuity can be many things. It can cause a man to be paedophilic. It can cause a man to develop feelings for a sister. Uh, cause a man to develop feelings for animals, sexual feelings for animals. So that all comes from the Ashaq Jinn. And that's why a lot of people with MPD have very twisted, sick minds when it comes to their sexuality. They are always dark when it comes to sexuality. They love BDSM. They love pain and and, you know acts that are not dignified in in intimacy and they just have a very dark preference for what they do sexually and more often than not you know people who marry narcissistic men and women um they find it very difficult to please their narcissistic partners sexually because of what they want done um it's like it's it can be vile sometimes what they want their fantasies are vile their fantasies are are really haram for example and it's just unacceptable for someone dignified to accept the sexual preferences of um those who have npd so ask anyone ask anyone they'll tell you that their minds are twisted when it comes to sex their minds are filthy when it comes to sex like more um it's more sinister. It's more sinister and degrading than your average person. So the Ashiq Jinn here will use sex and sexual preferences to um, influence the person who is now developing, in the early stages of developing narcissistic personality disorder. And the Qareen is fueling the mental health, the negative mental health of the narcissist. So, for example, it will fuel the narcissist misogyny. It will f- continue to fuel their hatred for their parents. It will continue to fuel their mistrust in people. So, for example, their qareen will constantly tell them that everyone will abandon you. Everyone's going to abandon you. So abandon them before they abandon you. And that's why narcissists always have to have the first discard. Because they always know you're going to abandon them because they don't feel worthy of you staying with them. They know the relationship is not going to last forever. They know it has an expiry date. So they always have to make sure that they discard you before you discard them. Because if you discard them before they discard you, not only will they feel humiliated because they feel like you're smarter than them, but you also reopen that childhood wound of feeling unworthy, unaccepted, unloved, abandoned, neglected, you bring all that back. And again, it fuels their hatred for their parents even more. Even if their parents had passed 40 years previously, previous to that, they'll still hate their parents. That hatred will still continue to grow. And every time a narcissist has a failed relationship with somebody, that childhood trauma is fueled, and that's why it gets worse. That's why their MPD gets worse and worse and worse with age. Because every experience that they have with a codependent or an empath will will harm them and damage their ego. So the Qareen, um, the Qareen's mission by the shaitan is to use this human being who is emotionally damaged to fulfill his purpose. So the narcissist is an easy target for the Qareen because their guard is already down. They're already engaging in major sins. They're already engaging in, you know, habits such as like, you know, smoking weed and, and alcohol. You know, when you're intoxicated and when, when, when a human being is in the state of being intoxicated, that is when the jinn are drawn to you. 
the jinn can actually enter you. They can actually possess you while you're high. They can possess you while you're drunk. And that is why people act in very strange ways when they're drunk. They will act like crazy people, immoral people. Like they will be a completely different person when they're drunk. It's not them. That's the jinn that's possessed them. Um, the same thing when, pe- when, when people are high. Or when they, ha- when they eat magic mushrooms and they hallucinate. All of these things are actually down to the jinn that possess them in that moment. And that's why it's very dangerous to be around people who are in a state of being drunk because they can murder you. They, someone can actually get murdered and, and really physically harmed by someone who is drunk because they're so intoxicated. But the jinn, the evil jinn, take it as an opportunity to use the human body to do what they want. They're like, yes, this is a fantastic opportunity to rape, to commit crimes, because I'm in a state of being intoxicated and everyone is, is going to let you know put it down to that person being drunk and out of his or her conscious. And that's why going to nightclubs is, you know, um, dangerous, because especially when people are in a state of being drunk. That's why so many rapes happen in nightclubs and, and places like that. Why do you think the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, he warned us about going to places like this? Because when people are intoxicated... The jinn take over and now you're not dealing with that human being but you're dealing with the jinn. You're dealing with the jinn that's out to get you. That's a demon out to get you. And there are lots of evil jinn that fantasize about using and abusing and exploiting the human body for their own crimes and pleasure. And they wait. They wait. And you know the shaytan said it in the Quran. He's like, I will wait and ambush them. You know? I will wait you know, behind them, in front of them, on their left, on their right. And I'll just wait for that opportunity when I can jump out and dig my claws into that person. And they wait for these moments when you're high, when you're drunk, when you're watching porn, <clears throat> when you're angry, when you're depressed. You know, why do you think people commit suicide when they're at their lowest? You think it's them? No, it's their qareen. It's the jinn, the jinn devils that have managed to get into, you know, the heart, the spiritual heart of that person because they have allowed that person in by committing those sins. They've opened a door. They've opened a door for those shayateen to come in. And there are people in various parts of the world that actually smoke marijuana and they smoke, um, you know, various types of drugs like cocaine and heroin and they will eat magic mushrooms so that they can call the jinn. A lot of magicians do this, by the way. A lot of magicians do this. So how do people become magicians? They have to be in a state of being intoxicated first. Because when you're in a state of being intoxicated, your ve- your vibrational level now matches the jinn. So when you start seeing hallucinations, disturbing hallucinations... A lot of them see really horrific things, like nightmarish stuff. But that's, it's, that's the portal that you've now opened between you and the jinn. You are now calling that jinn into your world. So people are like, oh, it's just smoking, it's just weed, it's just, it's just you know, pornography here and there. You don't understand the portal that you're opening for demons to come in and affect you so badly. People who, people who watch pornography excessively are extremely depressed. Extremely depressed people. People who smoke all the time are depressed. People who smoke weed all the time are depressed. Because they rely on that weed to get them through the day. They rely on that drink to get them through their traumas and their problems. They're depressed people. The more they drink, the more depressed they get. Because it's like they're trying to cover the problem with a plaster that keeps falling off and the wound keeps getting more and more infected because it's not being cleaned, it's not being attended to, it's not being addressed properly with the right, you know, with the right equipment and the right medication. When you constantly put dirty plasters on an open wound, what's going to happen? It's going to get worse. So no matter what you do, no matter what addictions you turn to, all you're doing is opening the door more and more and more 
for these problematic and evil jinn to come into your life. And this is why I say, I go back to what I said in the beginning of the podcast, it's not the human being who hates you. The shaitan sends his soldiers through us. And the qareen and the evil jinn and the ashiq jinn, they need to find the most vulnerable among us. And the most vulnerable among us are all the narcissists. All the narcissists and psychopaths. They are the easiest target for the jinn and the qareens because there's no connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no real deen. There's no, even if they, even if they you know, pretend to be practicing or pious or they pray and fast in Ramadan, the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not there. They just do it out of habit, out of ritual, you know, out of saving face. They've got to be seen in the mosque during Ramadan, taraweeh. Um, they do it just for superficial reasons or just to show off, oh, look how great I am. I'm always in the mosque, I'm practicing, everyone can trust me now because I look practicing. People will buy cars off me and he's a Fordster and just because he looks practicing, he gets away with it. People will be practicing and appear religious for various reasons, for their own personal gains sometimes. They're always narcissists. Those who use religion for personal gains, they're all narcissists. I've come across people who have committed outrageous fraud. And if you look at them, you'd think they're sheikhs. You'd think they're scholars and sheikhs. But they've conned people out of millions. Millions and millions. Just because people trust them because they appear to be religious. I'm going to do a separate podcast about this. Because these are the true hypocrites of Islam. But going back to my main point, the Qareen will attack um, and use and abuse the narcissist for, the, for his own gain. So when you have a mission, you want to think of the easiest way of doing it, right? So the shaitan has said, look, I want you to, he tells his assembly of, our, you know, his army of, of jinns, he says, look, I'm sending you all out today. Corrupt as many people as possible. Those who corrupt the most people will get a reward. So the easiest targets are the narcissists. They're not going to target highly empathic people or God-fearing people. It's too hard. It's far too hard. So the best bet that they have is to work through the narcissists to get to the empaths and to get to the codependents, and to get to the good God-fearing people. And how do they do that with the love bombing? They're clever. They're smart. So the satanic mission is through those who have narcissistic personality disorder. Because the jinn have found a way in with those who have MPD, for all those various reasons that I mentioned before. So once the jinn gets their foot in the door with the narcissist and now the qareen has full power over the mind and the desires and the ego and everything of this person, they now dictate how the narcissist behaves, okay? So the qareen will tell the narcissist what to do and the qareen will reward the narcissist by giving him an ego stroke. So, for example, if a narcissist gets away with something, a crime, the qareen will feed him thoughts, oh, you smart guy, oh, you wonderfully clever man, look what you managed to get away with. And it makes the narcissist feel really good about himself because the qareen is giving him those thoughts that, well done. Well done, you clever man. Oh, you fooled that person. Oh, you conned that person and he never even, never even suspected you because you look so religious. Well done. Well done for fooling that woman and for committing zina with that woman, promising her that you'd get married to her. Oh, you fooled her, right, didn't you? Brilliant boy. That's what they do. That's the, those are the thoughts that go into the narcissist's head. And that's why they're so arrogant. And that's why they're so deluded. Because they go around with no empathy. 
they're just so happy that they got away with it. They're just so happy that people believe them, that people fall for their lies and manipulations and gaslighting and tricks because they live in a world of delusion. They don't live in reality. They live in the world of the Qareen. And the Qareen is rewarding them mentally and psychologically for what they do. And that's why when other people are crying and hurt, the narcissist is like, you're not going to ruin my happiness right now. Oh, my Qareen is rewarding me. I don't know why you're crying. Nope, that ruined my happiness. And they can't comfort you when you're upset. After they've hurt you, they can't comfort you. Because now they're conflicted between, well, how can I comfort you when I'm in a state of happiness right now? And that's why they always smirk when people, you know, get upset because of them. They laugh at people's misery. They enjoy seeing people suffer. Why? Because that Karim is in their head rewarding them. Oh, you clever man. Oh, you're so powerful. Oh, look at the influence you have. Look how people fear you. Look how people walk on eggshells around you. You know, look how people, you know, worry about what you're going to say and what you're going to think. Look how people around you can't stand up for themselves. Can you see how powerful you are? Enjoy it. That's the thought. That's what, that's what goes through their heads. This is me knowing this after speaking to many narcissists in my life. This is what they tell me. That these are the thoughts that go through our minds when we have done someone over. When someone is crying because of us. When we've gaslit somebody or broken someone's heart. The empathy is not there because the qareen does not allow them to feel that empathy. Because every human being has empathy. But the qareen does not allow him or her to feel that empathy. And that's why people are like, how can you be so cold? You know, you, you know, your wife is crying, your husband is, you know, broken hearted, you've just betrayed him with another man and you're just sat there cold like you don't care. Yeah, they're not going to care because they're ruled by their qareen. So it's not actually the human being in them that hates you. It's the qareen that hates you. And the qareen is using that narcissist to punish you and to corrupt you and to ruin your iman, ruin your life ruin your mental health, ruin your physical health, destroy your family unit, it's all happening through that qareen. Because you will see glimpses now and then of the narcissist being very vulnerable. It's like they want help. I've seen it. I've seen it many times in my life where a narcissist is like, help me. I need to get out of this. I don't know what's happening to me. I don't know why I'm the way I am. I don't know why I enjoy seeing people suffer. I don't know why I keep self-sabotaging. I don't know why none of my relationships work out. I don't know. I don't like that people hate me. I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, most narcissists don't know what's wrong with them. They know something's wrong. They know they have a gin problem. Because they would have experienced from teenage age lots of disturbing dreams. And lots, lots of them as well have reported seeing things. Seeing shapes and, you know, weird silhouettes when they were younger. Especially if they smoked weed, you know, starting off when they were teenagers. If they were very into their smoking, you know, during 15, 16, 17, they would have had a lot of disturbing dreams and they would have seen things. That is when the Qareen takes over and the Ashaq Jinn enters, enters that person's psyche or enters their body. Not everyone's possessed. Sometimes the Jinn will just enter your psyche and just rule your mind completely. So sometimes that human being will come to their senses. You, that's why you'll see glimpses of it now and again. But you never know if they're telling the truth because one minute they're saying sorry and that I need help. And then the next five minutes they're abusing you again. So it's very difficult to help a narcissist. This is why you cannot change a narcissist. You cannot be the one to save them and help them. Because the, it, the issue is not them, the issue is in their qareen. And they have a responsibility to overpower their qareen. This is why, you know, I see a lot of people, a lot of clients, they say, oh, um, I can change him, I can change him, or I can help her, 
you know, I will help her, I'm supporting her, I'm taking her for, for this ruqya and that ruqya. None of it's going to help if the narcissist himself or herself has not made a firm decision to battle the qareen and battle the ashaq jinn and battle any other jinns that come into them. You can't help them because it has to come from a deep will to overcome them. If you're just dragging them from Ruqya Sheikh to Ruqya Sheikh, no, you're not going to get anything out of that. If you're paying thousands in therapy fees to help them, then yeah, they might get an understanding of their disorder. They might get an understanding of where their childhood trauma comes from. But that doesn't solve their qareen and spiritual issues. That doesn't solve the torment that they go through. So... You will find that narcissists, like I said, they don't hate you. They don't actually hate you. A lot of them, you know, they feel empathy. They feel real love. They feel real emotions. But they're impossible to have relationships with. Because they're ruled by um, spiritual demons. When you're living with somebody who is ruled by a spiritual demon, no matter what you do, that relationship will never work out. And you will end up destroyed. Because the qareen is just seeing it more of a challenge. The longer you stay, the more of a challenge you become. And that's why the longer you stay in a narcissistic relationship, the worse the abuse gets. It gets worse. It never gets better. If you're consistently hoovered back into a relationship, if you don't know what hoovering is, I've got a podcast, one of the previous ones. Please check it out. You know, when the narcissist discards and then comes back, discards then come back, discards and comes back. That's all hoovering. If you're consistently being hoovered, every time you're hoovered back into the relationship with the narcissist, it gets worse. Because they've got no respect for you. They're thinking, hold on, this person knows I'm an abuser. This person knows what I've done to them before. They were harmed before by me. Why are they taking me back for the second time? Fifth time, tenth time. So every time you take them back, their qareen despises you even more because now their qareen believes that you do not deserve any good treatment. If you accepted to be, you know, to be hoovered back into a relationship, the qareen is like, well, you're getting what's coming to you because you have no self respect. You really want to be destroyed? Okay, I'm going to do my worst this time. I'm going to do my worst. So it is a spiritual problem that narcissists have. It's a spiritual problem. And yeah, you know, you feel sorry for them. I, I feel sorry for narcissists. I really do feel sorry for them. But I don't feel sorry for them when they know what, they know the problem that they have, but they don't want to change. Because remember, a lot of narcissists, they like being the victim. More often than not, you'll find that the narcissist is happy being the victim. Because they just can't be bothered to change. They can't be bothered to fight their qareen. So they've come to the realisation and acknowledgement that they've got a spiritual problem, they've got a jinn problem and a qareen problem, but they can't be bothered. They really can't be bothered to deal with it. They know that if they want to, they can, but actually playing a victim... Playing an abuser and playing the manipulator works works for me. So I think I'm going to stay here, thanks. There are lots of narcissists like that. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created hell. Hell is there for people who are like this. They have an opportunity to change, but they decide that, no, I actually like all this filth and corruption and and I like working with demons. I'm happy here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has destined the hellfire for these people. And there are narcissists who, you know, when they come to the realization that they have a spiritual problem with the jinn and with the qareen, who's also a jinn, they want to get rid of it. They want to change. They're like, no, I don't want to stay in this anymore. I want to have healthy relationships. I want to feel love. I want to move on with my life, I want to have a marriage, I want to have a family, I want to just live like a normal person. There are lots of narcissists who want that as well. But it's not up to you to help them, you can't help them. 
لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not burden anyone with a burden they cannot bear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given you the obligation of changing people. If the Prophet Muhammad sallam was not given that task, then who are we to take on the disorders of narcissists? Why are we taking that on? Just to be heroes and just to be... No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not expecting that of us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I've only sent you to convey the message. Convey the message and everyone is responsible for their own actions. Everyone is responsible for their own healing. Everyone is responsible for making a change that is needed for them to be better people, better Muslims, you know, better believers, better human beings. It's not your responsibility to take that on. Because you will see in yourself and many other people around you who have tried to take it on, it's destroyed them. I gave you the example in a previous podcast of a narcissist drowning in the middle of the ocean. There's no, there's no, there's no support. And you want to help pull the narcissist out from the middle of the ocean, but the narcissist is dragging you down with him. Because you're trying to, put, he's just too heavy. You're trying to pull him out. You're trying to save him from his own, from his own chaos. But he's dragging you down with him in the middle of the ocean. You can't help a drowning person when you are in the middle of the ocean with them. Stop trying to fix these people. You cannot. It is a spiritual warfare way beyond your capability of dealing with. Way beyond. This is something that has to come from within. And if it doesn't come from within, you will always be tied in a toxic relationship with that narcissist. And that narcissist could be the parent, sibling, husband, wife, children. And that's why, you know, a lot of women, they say, I'll be patient for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm going to be patient for the sake of my children, for the sake of keeping the family together. I'm going to try and help this narcissist get therapy. Nothing gets better. Rarely, very rarely does it get better. Because I would say 2 to 3% of narcissists would say, they would recognise that they're self-sabotaging their relationship, their marriage, and it's a good marriage. They've got a good wife, a good husband. And they get those, they get those you know, moments of reality where they're like, what am I doing? What am I doing? Why did I do that? Why did I just beat up my wife? She's a good woman. Why did I do that? And they hate themselves. And then they put themselves in a position where they say, you know what? I need therapy. I need help. I need to do ruqya on myself. But it's still very difficult to live with a narcissist who is trying to heal. Because the person living with that narcissist has to accommodate. You've got to accommodate now. To help them heal. You've got to be more understanding of abuse. You've got to be more tolerant of abuse because you know that they're working on it. But does that make it better for you? Does that make you happier? No, it doesn't. It's still abuse. It's still abuse that you're going through. Now, I'm not encouraging people here to get divorces and and leave and all that kind of stuff. I'm not, I'm not saying that. There are ways that you can figure this out if you really need to. What I am saying is that unless that narcissist makes a conscious decision to change, you will always be in a toxic marriage because that Karin is after you. That Karin doesn't want the narcissist. The Karin's already got the narcissist. The Karin wants you. The demon is after you. So you are actually living with a demon every single day. Every single day when you're living with a narcissist, you're living with his demon or her demon. And that's a scary thought. And every day that demon is working on destroying you. And the first thing it wants to destroy is your iman and your faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the deen is always used to abuse until you hate the deen. And it's always taken out of context. It's always misused. It's always, you know, used in a very harsh manner. Harsh attitude. You know foot on neck approach 
to Dean, hellfire this and punishment that and God curse you this and God doesn't love you anyway that. You know, women are slaves, women are this, men are this. But men are only good for money. What's Like, religious abuse is used by narcissists to kill your iman. Once your iman is killed and destroyed and you no longer want to be Muslim because you've been through so much abuse in the name of Islam, the Qareen is like, oh, fantastic. Brilliant. Mission done. Now, at this point, the narcissist will discard you. If you're doing better, if they see that you not being in their life is actually helping your iman to be rebuilt, they come back and hoover you. They're like, oh, it seems like I didn't do enough damage. Oh, back for round two then. The Qareen sends the narcissist back. The Qareen will send the narcissist back into your life. Because the Qareen will know. The Qareen c- communicates with the Qareen of the victim. They check in. And sometimes I get a lot of people say to me, how does the narcissist know? How does my narc ex know when I'm moving on and I'm doing so well in my life? I always get the hoover when I'm doing so well in my life. When I've moved on and healed and gone to therapy. I get the narc hoover. The narc comes back. This could be after 10 years, 5 years, weeks, months. But it tends to happen when you're feeling better, when you're moving on. How do they know when to come back? When they have no way of contacting you, you've got no social media, no no flying monkeys, no mutual friends. How do they know? They know from their qareen. Their qareen will tell them. Their qareen will plant seeds in their head about you. Oh, remember this person? Check in on them. Check in on them. Now, sometimes the narcissist will come and find you in the same situation they left you in. Destroyed, depleted, drained. The qareen says, it's fine. Leave her. Leave him. We're good. You don't need, like, they're destroyed. They don't need a round two. The mission has been complete. So the, the narcissist will go and find new supply. Because again, you know, they are the they are the horse that the Qareen is directing which way to go. Now it's time to find new supply. But if the Qareen tells the narcissist to go back and check in on an ex that they destroyed, and the ex happens to be doing better, they're praying again, their iman is getting better. They've got a new job. They're looking happy. They found someone else. Oh, the Qareen is mad. The Qareen is mad and he'll torment the narcissist. He'll say, you're stupid. You didn't do a good enough job. Look, the person bounced back. Go back in for round two. Find any way and get yourself back in. So now the Qareen has sent the narcissist on a mission to get back in. So they love bomb again. They use manipulation, gaslighting, all that narcissistic stuff. Because the Qareen is like, whether you like it or not, you better get into the life of this person again. We can't, we can't fail. Now the narcissist is not conscious of this conversation going on between him and his Qareen. I'm just explaining to you what it is that actually drives them to Hoover. It's the thoughts that come into the head, but it's not often a conversation because they're not conscious of the Qareen. They just don't know where these thoughts come from. They don't know why they have an obsession with hoovering exes. They don't know where the obsession comes from. I'm telling you now, it's from that. So they come back to an ex and the Qareen has put them on a mission of whatever it takes, get back in. Whatever it takes. Now, if the narcissist manages to get, you know, manages to get their foot back in the door and get back into a relationship, the Qareen rewards the ego. Brilliant. You brilliant person. You clever person. What a fool that person is. Aren't they stupid? Aren't they so stupid to fall for that again? And so the narcissist in his head is thinking, yeah, so stupid. 
That woman is so stupid to take me back. And they're having a good laugh between themselves. The Narciss and the Qareen. They're having a good laugh at your expense. Because they've managed to get in again after everything they've done to you in round one. So now they're back for round two. And the Qareen this time will set a higher mission. They'll say, look, what you did before, it was good, but it wasn't enough. This time, I want you to add this. This time, I want you to add physical abuse. Before it was religious, now add the physical abuse. See if that, see if that kills it. See if that completes the mission this time. That's why when I keep telling people, never take a narcissist back after they've discarded you or after you've walked away. Never, ever fall for a hoover because that demon is out to get you. It's not the narcissist. It's the demon of that narcissist. It's the demon that makes that human a narcissist. So someone's taken the... Someone's taken the narcissist back. More abuse. Worse abuse. And the narcissist will keep doing this. They'll keep coming back to heat check. They'll discard. That's why they go through the whole devaluation, discard phase. Love bomb, devalue, discard. Love bomb, devalue, discard. They do it with everybody. A lot of people say, oh, but he's moved on. My ex has moved on with someone. And he or she looks so happy with a new supply. Rubbish. It's a little rubbish. As long as that person is controlled by his qareen and his aashiq jinn, he or she will never be happy with anybody. Because the qareen has set a mission for them every single time. Every single time. Now, sometimes the target is another narcissist. Sometimes a narcissistic man will go on to new supply and that new supply is also not a narcissist. But that narcissist is not so high up as they are. So the Qareen has, it's just an easy target, very easy target. Like, okay, she's narcissistic, but not as bad as you. So let's make her as bad as you. Leave her broken, depleted, hating all men. And then we can move on to someone more difficult. The shaitan takes it upon himself to tackle the hardest people, the hardest empaths, the hardest people to crack. And he sends his soldiers out for the other people. The easier targets. But the shaitan himself takes it upon himself to um, corrupt the most difficult people. Those who are steadfast, those who are real true believers, those who are supernova empaths. The shaitan uses that as his uses them as his challenge. His army of soldiers get get the rest of, every, of get the rest of society. They get the codependence. And the low level empaths and the code and the um narcissists. But the supernova empaths, oh no, they're kept for the shaitan himself. So what happens when a narcissist fails to hoover you? They get tormented. They get tormented by the Qareen. It destroys them. It destroys them when you walk away from a relationship with a narcissist. Before they discard you. Oh the Qareen is tormenting them. You stupid idiot. How could you not see that coming? How oh, you've humiliated us. You got the empath. Our victim. Our target. The one we've been abusing all this time. They stood up for themselves. And left the relationship. You sorry. Excuse for a human being. What have you done? I thought you were clever. I thought you were smart. I thought you were worthy. I thought you were a great team player. Oh, you're rubbish, aren't you? You're rubbish. So the narcissist goes into a rage. The narc rage, the famous narc rage. When you leave them. How dare you leave me? How dare you humiliate me? How dare dare you discard me before I discard you so the first reaction is rage because they're listening to all of this from their qareen you failure you idiot you imbecile you you're worthless you're you're you know your parents were right 
you meant nothing. You know, you're, you've got no self-value. You're pathetic. You're, you're a failure. The Qareen is telling them this to punish them because it's a failed mission. So the narc goes into a narc rage. Every time the narcissist victim stands up for themselves, the Qareen will punish that narc because the Qareen sets the mission for the narcissist to always be on top, always be in the position of power, always be in a position of intimidation. So the moment that the narcissist allows their victim to stand up for themselves, the Qareen goes mad. And when the Qareen goes mad, the narcissist goes into a rage. And that's why when you stand up for yourself, when you're having a fight with your husband or wife, they just go into a horrible rage, horrible, de- you know, demonic rage. And you actually see their Qareen through their eyes. So many people have told me, and I've seen this myself as well, that when a narc goes into a rage, you see Satan in their eyes. You actually see Satan in their eyes, man or woman. You just you just see a demon. You're seeing their demon, the demon that hates you. Because you've offended that demon, that Karin that's been working on you for so long. So now that demon is in, enraged. That rage of the rage of the Qareen is coming through the the narcissist now the the human, and it's being you know the his emotions are being expressed through the human body of this narcissist. So it's not actually the human being that's in a rage; it's the Qareen that's in a rage, and that's why you see demon. That's why you feel a demon spirit, and that's why you see that Qareen, that jinn, in his eyes or her eyes. I'm I've got goosebumps telling you this. But it's true. This is what you see. And that is why the moment of rage for a narcissist is so scary for victims. Because they actually, you know, in those moments they get to see the qareen of that person manifested in the human body. I'm telling you, a lot of people won't tell you this. Like, this is probably the first time you've ever heard something like this. But this is what it is. This is exactly what it is. So when you walk away from a narcissist, um, that qareen will now torment them. And they'll torment them through nightmares. That's why narcissists don't sleep. They have insomnia. They have serious, you know, they've got really bad sleeping um, habits because the qareen will always remind them of failed missions. So if you ask a narcissist about their past and you realise that their victims actually escaped before they got their narc discard, you will find that that narcissist doesn't sleep. He's always got bad dreams, bad nightmares, um, always got negative thoughts. He's always moody, always depressed, always low in a low mood. No matter what what good happens in him, his or her life, they are always so moody, always so down. They're always so depressed about something. It's like... Why are you always so depressed? But they, you know, they can't tell you that they're being tormented. Because most of them don't even understand it. They don't understand what's happening to them. I really hope that any narcissist who's listening to this can relate to this and take it as motivation to actually do something. Because this isn't something that narcissists want to hear. But you have to hear it. Narcissists have to hear this. I I feel, I've I've got goosebumps even just recording this. Because it's it's creepy stuff. Um, you find a lot of Christians as well. They talk about you know demonic spirits and everything. They believe in this as well. They believe that narcissists have been taken over by demonic spirits, but they don't understand the concept of the qareen, and the concept of, you know how it's linked to narcissistic behavior like this. So. The Qareen will punish the narcissist for failed missions. That's why you just cannot. It's unacceptable to a narcissist that you walk away. They will go into a narc rage. And that narc rage that you're seeing is not that is not that person. Always remember, the narc rage is their Qareen. You're seeing their Qareen face to face. Now then, the other time that a Qareen will have a rage episode... And not just when you defy them and stand up for yourself and walk away from the narcissist and decide to go no contact. It's when 
they fail to hoover you back in. So they will try different tactics to try and get back into your life. Round two, round three. And if the narcissist fails in their love bombing, fails in their manipulation and ways of trying to get back in, they will be tormented for that as well. So a narcissist, the human part of the narcissist, has two options now. They either run and find new supply as soon as possible. That's why narcissists jump into new relationships as soon as one ends. Within days sometimes, you'll find that a narcissist is already in a full-blown relationship with somebody else. A narcissist always, or always has to have a backup. It's like, you know those sports day um, races, the bat and relay races? It's the same. So... You know, they have to overlap. So narcissists, 99% of the time, will have someone in the wings waiting. So in case this one, you know, but they, they, they pick someone easy. They pick someone easy to go to. So if you walk away from them, they tend to go back to old supply or they go for another narcissist. That is why when you walk away from the narcissist, the new supply, more often than not, is another narcissist like them. Because it's an easy target. And they go for an easy target just to stop the qareen from tormenting them. Because they just want the qareen to be happy. It's like, hey, right, I'm going to go for this narcissistic woman right now, or narcissistic man. I need to complete the job because I can't have you, you know, telling me all this stuff 24 hours a day. I can't hear it. I need you to be proud of me. So... I'm going to go to someone easier. Guys, this is why I keep telling you. The new source of supply is always an easier option. It's not someone better than you. Not someone this. Not someone that. When, a, when you walk away from a narcissist. And they jump into another relationship. 99% of the time that person is another narcissist. Easy target. Because they need the qareen off their back. They need the qareen's abuse off their back their men you know their mental psychological verbal abuse they don't want to be dealing with it so if they can jump to a new target and corrupt that target then at least they'll get some they'll get some ego stroking back from the from the qareen so they have to jump into a relationship as soon as possible because if they don't jump into a relationship as soon as possible with somebody else as a distraction they will be left alone with the qareen who despises them right now can you imagine spending the next week two weeks month three months six months with a qareen that hates you right now who thinks you're so stupid who thinks that you are the dumbest person on the planet for letting him down can you imagine that torment that psychological torment so narcissists can't live by they can't be by themselves this is why they hate their own company because they're not in the in, in their own company. They're in the company of their qareen. The qareen needs them working 24-7. There's no rest for a narcissist. There's no rest. And that's why a narcissist has to keep constantly looking for supply. And to avoid the wrath of the qareen, they tend to have more than one person on the go. Just in case one fails, they've got backup options. Three, four, five women, five men at the same time. Just in case. Because they don't want to deal with the qareen. They don't want to deal with the qareen on their own. And this is why narcissists can't be on their own. It terrifies them to be alone. They always have to be around people. They always have to be around a victim. Because when they're on their own with the qareen, they get very dark thoughts. Very, very dark thoughts. And they reflect on everything that they've done. The Qareen reminds them, hey, remember last year? You idiot, what you did. And you remember the year before that? And the year before that? And the year before that? So narcissists always think about everything that they've done. All the bad stuff that they've done when they sit by themselves. So they can't sit by themselves. And that's why they don't sleep. Because they keep thinking about everything that they've done. So they're only in their best element. Narcissists are only in their best element when they have really pleased that Qareen. And that Qareen is giving them the best ego stroke. Or you are now back on the pedestal. You're back on the pedestal. So if you look at the narcissistic relationship with that Qareen from this perspective, you'll understand why I say that. The narcissists are people to feel sorry for. 
they're not people to be feared. They're victims. They're victims in their own right. And that's why when I wrote my book, the, um, the book wasn't meant to attack narcissists. The book is meant to protect the victims of narcissists, make them aware of the narcissist, of the narcissist mission. And at the same time, it's an awareness for narcissists to get the help that they need. It's an awareness for narcissists to understand their disorder and actually, you know, realise where it all comes from, why they are the way they are. It's help rather than an attack. Because when you know this information, you can actually sit with yourself and realise, actually, yeah, that's exactly what's happening with me. That's exactly what's happening. Right now I know, now I know what I need to do. Now I know what I need to do to fix this problem, get rid of this qareen. Well, actually, you can't get rid of the qareen. <clears throat> the qareen is with you until you die. But what you can do is that you can overpower your qareen. So instead of the, the qareen ruling you, you rule the qareen. And that's what makes empaths so powerful. The empaths and the super empaths are extremely powerful because they rule over their qareen. They shut their qareen up. They put the qareen in their place. The qareen doesn't have that power over the empath to steer them left or right whenever they want. No, it's the empath that tells the qareen what to do. So when the qareen puts an evil thought into their mind, the empath will shut it down saying, no, sorry, not today. Not today, mate. Not welcome here. These thoughts are not welcome here. And then what will happen with time is that the qareen will learn just to stay silent with an empath. Because they know that it doesn't work. They're chained, blindfolded and gagged. Because the empath doesn't allow them to have that authority over them. And that is why people with NPD are so jealous of, of um, empaths. They're so jealous of empaths. Because they're like, I want that strength. Oh my God, help me, get me out of this. Get me out of this prison that I'm in. But I can't be as strong as you. So they hate empaths. That's why I tell you, you know, there's a, there's a hate for empaths. You'll be living, you'll be living with a narcissist, right? Doing everything to make them happy. But you just feel like they hate you. That feeling of hate is real, guys. It's real because they do hate you. Their narcissistic character, which is them plus their qareen, that makes them the character they have, hates you. They'll pretend to like you, but oh, that hate leaks out. That resentment, that bitterness leaks out because they see you as better. They see you as powerful. They see you as someone who's free. You're not imprisoned by what they're imprisoned by. They see you as strong and powerful. They know that empaths are more powerful. That's why narcissists always choose empaths as victims because it's out of jealousy that they want to cripple you. They're like, no, you have to be like me. You've got to be imprisoned like I am. How come you have strength and I don't? You always remind me that I'm weak. Get rid of all the empaths. Because the empaths remind the narcissists of their weakness. Heavy podcast, I know. Heavy, very intense. But had to be said. Had to be said. I really hope this makes sense to you guys because um, the podcasts that are coming after this will make so much more sense to you. Even when you listen to other YouTube videos about narcissism, boy, will they make sense to you now. And psychologists, until now, because they've got no spiritual background, they do not know. I'm talking about secular, secular psychologists. They don't know how to explain any of this NPD stuff. Because they don't believe in demons, they don't believe in Satan, they don't believe in God. So, they, they, they can't put their finger on where NPD comes from. It's a spiritual warfare. Really, really scary stuff. Um, always remember that if you've walked away from a narc or the narc has discarded you and they've come to hoover you, I just want you to remember this because this will help you resist and block the narcissist from ever coming back in. 
It's not them. It's not that human being coming back. It's the demon coming back for round two. That demon's coming back for another round to destroy you. Now, when you visualize that and when you are aware of that, it becomes so much easier to not fall for that hoover. Once you get out of a narcissistic relationship, stay out of it. Stay out of it. Or at least, the very least, put boundaries. Because if we're talking about the narcissistic people being your parents, you can't cut them out of your life, but you can put boundaries. Distance yourself. You know, create some distance. Create some boundaries of respect. So that you're not tolerating abuse from from them anymore. Because it's not them. It's not your parents, it's the demons that they have that want to destroy you. And you destroy the demon when you don't allow it to fulfil its mission. And that's why narcissists are always so troubled. They're the most depressed people on the planet. They will never show that to you though. They'll show you that they've moved on and they're happy with the new supply and everything is hunky-dory because they need to make you feel like you're missing out. That's the delusion of the Qareen. The Qareen needs you to see that, oh, you've lost something shiny, something glitzy. You're the problem, not the Nark. The Nark found another relationship. You're still stuck there alone. Who is the problem? It's not the Nark. It's you. And then the self-doubt creeps in. You think, actually, yeah, maybe it is me. Maybe I'm the problem. I need that Nark back. So either you go chasing the Nark back again, thinking that you're the problem... Or you allow the knock back in when they hoover. It's all a delusion. It's all a show. The Qareen wants you to see that. The Qareen and the Ashiq Jinn, they want you to see the narcissist as being a wonderful person. That's why so many people fall for the facade. An empath will not get with a narcissist most of the time because they can clock on to their energy, their bad energy. But someone who isn't, who's more naive to the signs of narcissistic behaviour in people from the beginning. You know, the ashiq jinn that they have will allow them to see this narcissist as, wow, this is, this is the best, this is the best I can get. So, I hope that has um, clarified many things for you, explained many things for you. Please like the video if you liked it. Please subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed. I've got so much more content coming. Please share this podcast with anyone who you feel needs to hear it. And, you know, I really pray. I really, really do pray that any narcissist listening to this will get the help that they need. That they will, this will motivate them to really make a change in their life. I really hope that this podcast has been life-changing for not just the narcissist, but for their victims too. Because when you see it in this light, when you see the issue and, you know, from this perspective, oh, things just become so much easier to deal with because it's clear. It's much clearer now. So I hope, inshallah, that, um, that you've benefited. Please do comment below if you've got any Anything to add, anything to say. Thank you again for listening if you've made it this far. And if you're a victim, just the last note, if you're a victim of narc abuse and, you know, alhamdulillah, you've worked on your iman, you're back to praying, you're back to reading the Quran, you're back to having a good relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, just really remain, st- try your best to remain steadfast on that. Don't let the qareen of the narcissist destroy you. Don't let it take away the most precious thing to you that makes you so powerful. Hold on to it. Hold on to it for dear life because this is what the Qareen wants to take away from you. And the failed mission of the Qareen, you know, is is your victory. It's your victory. So if you're a victim at the moment and you feel like your Iman is being depleted, don't let that Qareen win. You know, find ways to elevate your Iman. Elevate your nafs. Elevate your, you know, your state of being. Refer to previous podcasts that I have... Um, recorded there's a video there's a podcast called how to elevate your nafs please listen to it it will help you um, reconnect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the middle of a trauma in the middle of a toxic relationship because I'm here to help you guys 
not let the Qareen win. Don't let him win. Don't let them win. Yes, the narcissist will be tormented by it. The human, the human part of the narcissist will be tormented. But sometimes that torment is needed for that narcissist to wake up and actually say one day, I don't want to be dealing with this anymore. I can't be dealing with this depression. Why do you think a lot of narcissists commit suicide? Because sometimes they can't deal with the torment of the Qareen. They can't deal with it anymore. A lot of young narcissists commit suicide. So I hope that the, you know, if if a narcissist has got to that point where they're so tormented by the Qareen that they decide to put an end to it. Put an end to that toxic relationship you have with that Qareen. Stop letting that Qareen overpower you. You can become powerful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told you that you are able to elevate your nafs and you can fight your jinn and you can fight your qareen if you want to. You have that choice. But if you want to stay victim, then you're a loser in this dunya and the akhira. You're a loser in both worlds. So it's up to you. It's your decision to make. But please, please, you know, if, you, if you've lost your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Make that a priority. Make that a priority to regain that, rebuild it. Get that strong connection back with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you have to be victorious. You have to come out of this the winner. No matter what you've lost, no matter what you've lost in a relationship with a, a narcissist and his qareen or her qareen, you might have lost a lot of money, a lot of maybe physical health, a lot of energy, businesses, whatever it is that you've lost. It doesn't matter. As long as they don't take away your iman, they've taken nothing. If they've taken your iman, they've taken everything. If they've taken your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they've taken everything. Everything else will perish. But this is what you take with you to your akhirah. This is what you present Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with on the day of judgment. You have to be able to stand up in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment and say, I fought with everything I have. To protect my iman and my relationship with you. And you never know that because it was such a difficult battle that you had to face with not only your qareen, but the qareen of somebody else trying to destroy you, that could be your golden ticket to Jannah without hisab, without any accountability. Because this is the highest form of jihad and nafs. It's the highest form of it. So make sure that... Even if you lose everything in this dunya, that on the day of judgment, you will have the ability to stand up for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say that you present to him a good, a good sound heart and your relationship with him and your, and your iman and your tawakkul in him. Don't ever lose that. Don't ever let a narcissist make you lose that. Because if a narcissist takes that, he's won. And we can't let them win. Because if we let them win the narcissist, narcissism will grow. There will be more narcissists in this world. We have to put a stop to it by preventing, uh, preventing us from being enablers of their abuse. We have to stop the abuse. We have to stop them from winning. Out of hope that the torment that they get from the qareen will wake them up before it's too late. So, I'll end it here. Thanks so much again for listening. And I um, will speak to you soon, inshallah, in the next podcast. So until then, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.